Well, this is uh, Recalling Employees to the Workplace. This webinar is a part of the Detroit Means Business uh, uh, support series uh, that is a set of financial and reopening resources as well as technical assistance um, that is being made available to all small businesses, sort of two employees to 50 or really 50 and under uh, in the city of Detroit. Uh, it is a joint effort. I would start naming partners, um, but when you start doing that, you will uh, inevitably forget some. Suffice to say that there are a ton of business support service organizations, uh, larger companies, the city of city governments and DEGC uh, that are all partnering together to try and make sure that when uh, we have the go ahead to reopen here in the city, that Detroit businesses uh, will be ready to go. And then ongoing, we wanna make sure that you're continuing to get the support that you need to make your businesses as successful as possible in some very uh, uh, difficult times. So uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. My name is Ned Stabler. Uh, I'm the Vice President for Economic Development at Wayne State University, right here in the heart of Detroit. And I'm also the President and CEO of TechTown Detroit. We have an amazing uh, uh, pair of panelists today, two of the most knowledgeable uh, and intelligent and qualified and talented people in the city uh, who are going to be helping us on today's webinar. Um, and I will introduce them in just a second. Um, I want you to know that uh, this is on Zoom. So if there is a question in particular that you have, please use the Q&A uh, box. It should be right down in the bottom middle next to chat. It's Q&A. And when I see those there, I will try to bring them up to our panelists um, and bring them to their attention. We'll answer the ones that we can in writing right there, or we'll do it in, in sort of live audio if, um, uh, if it's the kind of thing that we think makes sense for the entire group to hear. So with that, let me start by, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, our two speakers. The first one who is not here yet, and that is a little bit by design, she got called into a meeting with Mayor Duggan uh, at 2.59, and uh, we'll be back shortly, is Nicole Sherrard Freeman. She's the Executive Director of Workforce Development and Detroit at Work for the City. She's responsible to the Mayor and the Mayor's Workforce Development Board for leading strategies that get and keep Detroiters employed, for providing 8,000 paid summer experiences for Detroit youth through Grow Detroit's Young Talent, and ultimately for solutions that help Detroiters move out of poverty. She's been in the seat since August of 2019. While her job is usually about getting people jobs, her team has taken on new responsibilities for helping residents and employers with UIA and programs like WorkShare that you're gonna hear more about today. Detroit at Work oversees partnerships like the one Detroit Means Business now has with Everything HR, and again, Nicole had this urgent meeting with the mayor come up. She will join us just a little bit later. So, um, but that's a, a good segue to uh, Felicia Harris, who is an award-winning human resources innovator and financial expert. Uh, Felicia is principal and CEO of Everything HR and Everything HR Financial Services. She is also the founder of the Everything HR Talent Development Institute. Um, she's headquarters in Rochester Hills and also offices in Detroit's tech town and she does classes on local college campuses. Felicia has 30 years experience in HR and more than 25 years of employee organizational and professional development training experience. She's worked with everybody from C-level management at, at big fortune 500 type companies all the way down to the, the sole proprietorships. Um, she's overseen a billion dollars of assets and served in the financial industry as a vice president for more than 25 years. I would read all of the awards that uh, she has uh, gotten over those years, but of course that would eat up our entire time. So suffice it to say, she is incredibly qualified and has been recognized as such. She's the perfect person to kick this off and start talking to us about uh, WorkShare and how we're going to uh, use it and how you can use it as a small business to start to reopen here in the next few weeks. And she's also gonna tell us how it interplays with lots of other programs with cool initials like PPP uh, and UIA and other things that you probably are uh, getting very familiar with. So with that, I'm going to bow out now and turn it over to Felicia Harris, uh, who is gonna start off. And I think she has a PowerPoint that hopefully we'll be able to share. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much, Ned. And thank you guys for having us here. 
as you stated, I do want to talk about power, talk about WorkShare. And so I'm going to go ahead and get started with the PowerPoint so that we can start. Let's see here. Okay. Um, our agenda for today is really to deal right off the bat with some of those concerns that you have as a small business owner. And so the main problems and things that we hear uh, from small business owners and is returning employees back to work. And so we're going to talk about that and talk about the solutions for it. And that's what leads us right into WorkShare. We're going to talk about how PPP and WorkShare go together. We're going to talk about the difference between uh, work share and straight unemployment. Then we're going to talk about the tools that you really need to call employees back to work. And then we're going to talk on that subject about what do you do about those employees that refuse to return to work. And we're going to open it up for Q&A for you. Okay. We're calling those employees back to work. Do you understand the biggest problem that a lot of employers are having is the PUA, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. Because you have a number of employees that are making more money on unemployment than they are coming back to work. And so the challenge about that is basically taking a look at right off the bat, understanding that with WorkShare, um, you can take an employee that's you know making about $800 a week and place them on WorkShare and reduce their hours by 25%, that means that for the same amount of that reduction, they would get $600 per week, plus 25% of for unemployment uh, coming to them from the state, and continue to receive the $600 uh, from the pandemic. So for the most part, that same employee would end up earning $1,290 versus the standard $962 that they're receiving on unemployment benefits. So right off the bat, we can actually see this employee will take home more money on unemployment than they would on just unemployment. Okay, and here it is again. So it's better to look at WorkShare. WorkShare can really be looked at as being employment insurance instead of just straight unemployment or on, on that side for them. Now, what is WorkShare? WorkShare is a state of Michigan program that it's there to design uh, employers to align their productivity along with the economic conditions and their customer demands. So for the most part, WorkShare is not just here during this time frame for this pandemic that we're experiencing. WorkShare has been around for a few years. And so it should always be the first alternative that an employer look at instead of laying off their, their, uh, their workforce. So you might be able to actually save your workforce because they will always make more money if you keep them working and put them on, on unemployment. Okay, how does it work? Well, if you have an, a, a, your workforce, you're going to end up reducing their number of hours that they work, uh, and they're going to receive that same equivalent percentage in a reduction in their state unemployment uh, supplement. And so, do understand WorkShare only works if you have those employees that are eligible for unemployment. And so if you have people that have already been furloughed or laid off and you know that they're receiving a state benefit, do know that WorkShare will work for the, that employee base. For those employees that will not or did not receive a state benefit and they're on unemployment, you cannot put them on the WorkShare plan. They will not receive a state benefit uh, from the state in WorkShare. Okay, know that with WorkShare is very flexible for you. So you have the ability to have multiple plans if that's something that's needed. 
You can go up to an, an entire year on WorkShare itself, um, but do know you need to communicate that what you're doing on WorkShare with your entire workforce or those individuals that will be uh, a part of the plan. The eligibility for the employer, um, do know you have to have an EAN number. Uh, do also know that the governor expanded the eligibility uh, for workforce. Uh, it, if you have been someone that applied for workforce in the past and you did not qualify because maybe you had a debit in your uh, unemployment account, please try again because a lot of those things have been waived uh, for to make sure that this fits all of the employers across the state. You can also download a toolkit. We'll have that available on our website, as well as we'll show another site that you can get information. For eligible employees, as I stated earlier, those employees must be receiving some type of unemployment claim from the state now. Part-time uh, employees are also eligible for work share. And do you know the employees no longer have to certify under WorkShare to receive the benefit. It's you, the employer, that will be uh, actually certifying for each employee that's in the plan. How WorkShare work or how you apply for it, there is a YouTube video that's up um, that will take you through the application process, the certification process, and if you want to terminate a plan, how that works too as well. Do know when you're certifying that always will be, your certification date will always be on a Saturday. However, you can't certify on that Saturday. You can certify anywhere from that Sunday to that next Friday. So even though your date on your letter will say Saturday, the system is not set up to do it at that exact date. It's set up to do it the date after your certification date. All right, how WorkShare ties into the, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, do know that WorkShare works with PPP when your goal is forgiveness of your PPP loan. Um, the structure of your WorkShare plan must line up with your PPP award. So if you did your PPP uh, award based on the average of all your hours over the year, then the people that you put inside of there, you must take that in account when you put them on WorkShare in order for WorkShare to be a perfect tie-in for the forgiveness side of your award. Um, for the PPP, do you know that the main structure and the main thing on here um, is that last bullet point Knowing that with work sh with PPP, you're signing off that you must return the employees back to work from layoff. And knowing that uh, with WorkShare, you're literally certifying uh, with the employees that you will not lay them off. And so that highlighted bullet there, I will not lay off participating employees during the effective period of WorkShare. And so that you're bringing them back to work. Um, the Paycheck Protection Program and WorkShare. Do you know there is a bunch of toolkits and those sites you'll be able to get that information or obtain that information on WorkShare at those two locations? Recalling the employees back to the workplace. Um, we know that uh, when you decide to recall individuals back to work, you must make them an offer letter and include inside of that offer letter the return date. What are the terms of their employment? If there are any changes that have been made, what are those changes? As well as, is there any benefits changes? Um, inside of that benefits status, you want to go ahead and include the First Families Coronavirus Act and what your policy is going to be inside of that. Um, you can find a lot of that information on our website, um, too, as well. And then what are your safety protocols that you're going to have for your business? You want to include that inside of the letter. More importantly, you want to reassure 
your employee base that you have their best interests in mind as you're reopening as well as your customers' best interests in mind. Um, notify employees that a copy of the recall letter will be sent to the UIA. And for more information, you can get a lot more detailed information on our website. This is a sample of the notice that you would like to probably end up putting inside of the employees' uh, letters. It is your responsibility to notify uh, the unemployment office. I know I've had a number of conversations uh, with business owners who have felt that uh, the weight of being able to, you know, do I turn this employee in or do I wait um, and not just leave them on, uh, you know, unemployment and not say anything. Do you know you have a responsibility as the uh, employer to actually report that information to uh, the UIA. Okay. The PPP forgiveness, um, do you know if you've done all of those things and properly documenting those things and the employee um, decides that they do not want to come back? Uh, question number 40 from the SBA have actually dealt with this. The interim final is actually stating that as long as you have that formal offer letter to rehire them with all of that information I just uh, revealed to you and you send over with the employees uh, actual notice to you that they will not be returning to work, they don't care if it's a text message or whatever it is, you print it off and attach it to your offer letter to return, then that will not be counted against you for your head count. So we know there's two sides to the PPP forgiveness. One side is meeting the payroll. The other side is actually meeting the headcount. So if you do not want that employee that has decided that they're not going to return to be counted against you, that documentation is necessary. See ya. Okay. And so really quick, that's what we cover. We're returning the employees back to work. What is work share, the PPP and work share, work share unemployment, and returning employees to the workplace. And employees refusing to work. So now I'll open it up for whatever questions that you have. So Felicia, that was that was great. Thank you very much. Um, let me just see if I can sum sum up a couple of the key points because I'm, you know, I'm not that bright and sometimes I need things dumbed down for me a little bit. Um, essentially, you know, one of the concerns we've been hearing from businesses over the last few months is, well, with the extra $600 federal unemployment uh, award, it makes it a, you know, the equivalent of a 24, with the full state city state benefit, uh, equivalent of $24 an hour. Why would people come back if they're not, you know, going to make that? I don't pay them $24 an hour. Um, and so what you're telling us is that by utilizing the work share program, they can actually make more than that and come back to work so the businesses can open up. So uh, if they, for example, you reduce their wages by 30%, their hours by 30%, uh, they might lose a third of their state benefit. So it goes down to 200 and call it $50 or so if they were making the full amount, but they're still getting that 600. So they're gonna get uh, in addition to their wages. What really makes work share work is the fact that the reduction, the same percentage reduction in workforce hours, or the same percentage reduction in uh, their state of Michigan uh, benefit that they're receiving. Understanding that what the employer is paying them as wages will always be higher than what they're receiving in a state benefit. In the state benefit. That's, but they don't lose their 600 so they don't lose that 600 as long as throughout the time frame right now scheduled to stop in july throughout that time frame that individual will continue to receive that 600 now let's even take that a step further and say that at at the end of july the pandemic stops and now all that employee is receiving is the 362 dollars on unemployment do you know their employer wages is still there? If they're on work share, 
they're getting not only the reduction from work share, but to go back to your $200 in work share uh, from the unemployment with work share and their employer wages. So they're making more money always under work share than just on straight unemployment, which is why it's always the preferred route for any business that needs to cut back on their, their production or their expenses or anything um, during this time frame. And it's eligible to any business? Any business can sign up for WorkShare? Right now with the governor's expanded um, executive order and also under the CARES Act, there are more businesses that are eligible to apply for WorkShare than before. So yes. And what's the, uh, what are the, the parameters in terms of how much you can reduce hours so that they qualify for work share? Um, right now, the reduction goes all the way to from 60% uh, to 10%. Right. So you, it's, it can't be 90%. It's, it's got to be, uh, but, but still, that's a pretty 60%. It's a pretty significant amount. Correct. And um, we, there was, the, it used to be from uh, 25 to 45 and so she's expanded that to make sure it fits everyone because we rec she recognizes that uh, no one will be able to just go right back to pre-COVID levels. So you're gonna have to take this in stages and you may have to phase in different uh, units or departments um, of your business. So you may, if you're a restaurant, you back of the house or front of the house, may have different schedules and you're able to put those individuals on different schedules um, in a work share plan. So you can have multiple plans, one for front of the house, one for back of the house. Interesting. Interesting. That's all. That's great news. And you're um, just, uh, we've gotten this question. Uh, this presentation, is that available at everythinghr.net or? Yeah, available on everythinghr.net, uh, no later than six o'clock this evening. So it'll be up there. Fabulous. And of course, this webinar will be on uh, DetroitMeansBusiness.org as well. So uh, people can see it that way uh, as well if they want. Um, it looks like Nicole has uh, survived her her last minute meeting and is with us now. So I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Nicole Sherrod Freeman, who already got an introduction at the at the front. But Nicole, can you tell us a little bit about Detroit at Work and how this fits together with WorkShare and uh, some of the the unemployment programs that have been changing over the last few months? Sure. Um, can you hear me? Is my audio working? Sounds good. Great. So uh, thanks so much for the intro, Ned, uh, in my absence. And Felicia, thanks for all of your work on this. So, so most folks know Detroit at Work is a place to go to find a job, and employers know Detroit at Work is the place to go to find talent. Um, and so what, what we're doing during this time is expanding uh, the services that we offer to include being able to talk to you and help you with unemployment insurance to help uh, employers work through work share and hence our partnership with uh, Everything HR. We really want you to, to look to us as the resource uh, to help you solve some of the, the most pressing business problems that you're gonna face during this time. And so we're really excited to talk with you about work share. Um, Felicia is happy to talk with you about the Paycheck Protection Program. There's so many nuances and technical points to this program that some of the some of the finer points are best discussed in a one-on-one in -on -one conversation. I will say that one of the other things Detroit at Work is doing uh, at this time is working to understand what other HR needs, what other sort of um, talent planning uh, strategies do you need help with? We can help you find talent. So uh, we want you to uh, reach out to us and you should do that through Detroit Means Business. So you can call us at 844-333 8249 or visit us at DetroitMeansBusiness.org um, and scroll down and you'll find Detroit at Work or you'll find a place to chat with us or email us. We want to know more about what you need so that we can produce uh, content going forward that meets the needs of Detroit small business community. Turning it back over to Ned. I'm talking away here, but I was on mute. <laughs> so uh, don't worry. I just said the, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Felicia. Could you unshare your screen? Sure. I think that's, uh, yeah. Um, great. That way we can actually see more of Nicole. Um, that's, that is great. So we're, we're, we're starting to get some more questions. 
No, those are my responses and people thanking me for my responses. So um, is there anyone else in the audience who has questions that wants to use the Q&A or the chat to, to throw them in? These are some, some somewhat complicated quest, uh, topics. Um, aha, here's one. Sorry, I was on the wrong screen. So um, what if someone, Felicia, you mentioned before that if you asked an employee to come back to work and they said no, you could just put a copy of that no, whether it was a text message or an email, uh, as proof uh, for the feds on your forgiveness application. What if you won't fill anything out? You know, what if he's not sending you anything? What do you do? You treat that as what we call the job abandonment. You send out a letter to that employee stating that you have not received a response back from them. And you use that as being your proof and attach that to your initial letter that that person did not respond. So it's, it's called a negative non-consent. Okay. Uh, what if they get, your employees get sick? I know that is what uh, the FFRCA has provisions for that. So it does. What, do we, what, what do we do on that front? If, if they want to come back, but they're sick. Um, if the employees or, or taking care of a family member who might be sick. Right, and that's part of those policies of when you're sending out the benefits to them, you're letting them know what their what your benefits policy are uh, is, and inside of that, you would include the families first and what your policy is going to be on that. Um, and it let them know um, if they're eligible for any benefits from the state or federal government on that. If they are, um, I know already up on our website, we have the calculators up there, as well as we have at least the uh, reimbursement form that you have, or the advance form from the IRS is the 7200 form. That's already up on our website there. Um, I believe we do have also a frequently asked questions. And I know that we talked about doing a whole session just on that families first since, and break that down as far as what things you should need to do to prepare yourself as the employer and what your requirement is for documentation and holding it for the IRS. Thanks. Okay, so here's another great question. What about part-time employees? Do they count? Are they eligible? For work share, yes. Part-time employees are now eligible for work share. Okay. Um, and, and I think this question is a little more general. Um, how, how would you describe the difference between work share model from just underemployment? Um, work share actually, it's, it's considered to be a little bit of underemployment. In fact, they'll it use those terms interchangeably, underemployment and employment insurance. Um, if you take someone and just put them on unemployment, you know, automatically and not through work share, do you understand all that person is receiving is just a reduced unemployment side of, of the, you know, equation. If you're going to use it for PPP, that's when it becomes more valuable to you to be in a work share plan, because in work share, you're certifying when you're completing a plan that you will not lay those individuals off that's in that plan. Otherwise, utilizing, there's a calculation that you can use where the employees would still receive inf uh, funds from the employer as well as from uh, unemployment. Uh, just by paying them like a dollar less than what they were receiving. It's like one and a half times the amount and just a dollar under that, then they could get both and kind of make out uh, the same way. That method is good for those individuals that do not meet the work share program or the qualifications of receiving a state benefit and they get the 600. So I think this is an important uh, point to stress in, in a difference in unemployment and work share in that Work share, you actually, as an employer, have to set up a plan, mm -hmm. right? This is not just, well, I laid people off and they went on, they can go off and do this on their own. No, you actually have to enroll in this program so Correct. that your employees can get, get uh, to the benefits, get the benefits of the program, right? That um, is correct. Yeah. So that's important as, as employers. We're all trying to take care of our people. Uh, and this is another way that we can do that. Um, so here's, uh, here's, a, here's a question. Um, this person had an employee that was on payroll. They've been closed. They were on payroll, uh, but she signed up for unemployment anyway and received two weeks of benefits. Then she canceled her benefits because she didn't know she had to pay them back. 
<laughs> I assume she wasn't supposed to get benef- uh, get those benefits. She's probably going to have to pay them back, right? That's true. She would. She would have to pay those back. When any any employee, every time an employee goes in to certify, they're certifying that they have not received any income. That's why it's called unemployment. So they are not employed at all. So the moment that she report that she received that income, they're going to re- ask for those funds to report it back. Not to mention that person is going to show up on that employer's 1028 when they actually right. do um, their quarterly taxes of unemployment. Well, you should, as an employer, you should have gotten a notification that this person applied. And correct. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so here's a question. I, I don't. I, I'll try to generalize it for you. This person was sick and missed some work. Had all the symptoms. Got tested, but came back negative for COVID. Um, are they still eligible for the FFCRA or FRC? I don't remember which way it is. Family's First Coronavirus Response Act, CRA. Yes, um, is that uh, um, are they still eligible even though the test came back negative? Um, do know that there are negative uh, tests that come back negative, but they may be positive, or that person just still exhibiting symptoms. You, as the employer, if you feel that that person may be endangering your workplace you can still ask them to stay off and maybe take another test or consult their uh, physician for further details. Do know that under the Families First, they don't just tell you, an employee has to actually fill out a form. There's a form for them to actually put into you to request time to receive uh, paid sick leave or childcare. So they have to complete that form and in that form, it's just like it's, it's designed to follow the Family Medical Leave Act. If you are a larger employer, you have the same documentation. And that's what that's designed to actually follow. Well, in FMLA, they have to put a letter in from a doctor and whatnot. So presumably Correct. there's similar, okay. Correct. And, and when everyone was in a lockdown, they relaxed that portion of that standard because doctors were not actually seeing patients. So and during that time, it could be a verbal from uh, the employee and with okay. documentation to follow. So here's a great question uh, that I think affects all the employers on the call, uh, switching gears a little bit. In WorkShare, how is an employer's uh, uh, UI account affected? Um, right now it is not affected. Right now under the CARES Act, the federal government is picking up the tab um, for any employer that's enrolled inside of WorkShare. And so it doesn't affect the state's uh, an unemployment fund, which is wonderful for all of us that are employers. Anytime there's an economic downturn, regardless of whether or not you laid anybody off, everybody's rates go up. Right. But so this doesn't even affect the state side of it, let alone it the not. federal, obviously. It's fine. Exactly. So, and how long does that last in through July as well? Um, no. Actually, under the CARES Act, that will go through December of this okay. year. So it's the whole year. Oh, that's great. Mm-hmm. That's great. Uh, any other questions or thoughts? We've been on for about 40 minutes. Nicole, is there anything you want to add? Is there a Detroit specific uh, resource or uh, anything that, that you think needs to get mentioned? Um, just very pleased that we're able to provide uh, this support right now to Detroit small businesses with a very generous contribution from DTE Energy. So we're uh, very grateful for their support. Always great to make sure you're thanking the sponsors. Thank you. You should be doing my job. Um, <laughs> this, so I'm just checking here. When does PUI end? What's is that? What's P? I think that's probably PUA. Um, the PUA. That's the the pandemic uh, unemployment assistance. The six hundred dollars. Okay. That ends. It's scheduled to end in July. There is legislation out there to extend it in some form. But right now, it's set to end in July. Yeah. Um, I think there are a lot of us. There's a lot of uh, fluidity in Washington these days. And I think we'll all have to keep our eyes out to see if states and municipalities and universities and other uh, organizations and hopefully more checks to working people uh, as well. That would be great. So um, I do, uh, while Nicole reminded me that we uh, should thank our sponsors, I also want to remind uh, folks that we have another webinar tomorrow as part of this series. It's Inside Out Marketing. Uh, We're going to talk about an organic approach to marketing for reopening your business by examining the essentials of what marketing is, how to attract and reassure customers using various strategy and staging techniques, 
Um, you know, I think this is an important topic as we start to reopen because, um, you know, maybe last year when you were marketing, you were trying to tell them how great your product was or how tasty your food is. Now you also have to add a, an element of, and it's all safe and you can come in and we're taking care of you. Uh, whether you're coming into my retail establishment or eating my food, uh, it's not something that we as small business owners tend to, to think about. So, so tune in tomorrow. Um, uh, yeah, um, that question was already answered. I will answer it in the, in the, uh, the, the question and answer box. So um, yeah, tune in tomorrow. I believe it's one o'clock. Uh, I'm sorry, 10 a.m., May 22nd at 10 a.m. You can register uh, at DetroitMeansBusiness.org and uh, we're gonna be doing a whole series of these. Also, starting I believe next week, you're gonna be able to sign up for one-on-one -on -one coaching as well, getting short sessions on a variety of topics. Uh, great folks from SCORE and uh, SDBC, uh, SBDC, uh, the Small Business Development Centers, uh, are going to be around to help. I don't know if Felicia is signing up for that as well, but uh, if you want yeah. some more one-on-one -on -one coaching to ask some of those questions you didn't want to ask in a group format and get real specific about your needs, please do that. Uh, the City of Detroit, the Mayor, the, the various uh, stakeholder groups, the small business organiz uh, support organizations like TechTown, uh, are here to make sure that we can help you in every possible way. And we're not going away uh, because you're not going away. Uh, we're going to make sure that uh, Detroit comes back stronger uh, and hustles harder than ever. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, we will try to get a video of this out to people and it will be available at DetroitMeansBusiness.org as well. Thanks again uh, to Nicole and Felicia. We really appreciate all you're doing for small businesses right now. Thanks. <laughs>